time I came down to the Barrier Island Center was around 2007, and my son Sam was eight years old at the time. And he, I, I had enrolled him in pirate camp. I was staying in, in Willis Wharf uh, with my in-laws at the time and um, wanted him to have something fun to do uh, during the day for the week. So, um, so I was just like anyone else in the surrounding area that was you know, bringing my kid here for an educational experience, a fun experience. Uh, and then so I happened to be picking him up and Laura Vaughn, the director at the time, happened to be on the porch and we got to chatting and she asked, what do you do? And I said, I'm a documentary filmmaker. And she was like, oh, really? Her antenna went up. And uh, she said, well, we want to do documentaries here and uh, we're doing oral histories and so on and so forth. And I thought we were just kind of like shooting the breeze, you know, the way you do on a porch in the summer. And I think it was about six weeks later, I was back shooting the first film for them. Um, I unfolded very quickly. Uh, that first film we shot very quickly in a weekend, um, and that became Our Island Home, uh, which was about three um, people who could remember life on Hog Island in the town of Broadwater. And that was the beginning of, um, I didn't know at the time, but an ongoing more than a decade's worth of, of work on the Eastern Shore, chronicling the culture and the experience of, of the people here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my career has been a bit schizophrenic, you could say, because I've had these two different tracks to it. Um, I've, I have this ongoing series of Barrier Island Center uh, movies um, concerning the Eastern Shore and life here. Uh, and at the same time, I've sort of made a name for myself with, with a more investigative political um, documentaries uh, that have a real sort of um, critical point of view. Um, those are difficult to make and kind of um, grueling and um, I would say stressful to make uh, films about national security whistleblowers or war or what have you. And so um, it's actually been a nice balance to that, to be able to um, drop all of that for a while and come down here and begin begin another film. And it's always like, I kind of fit back into the pace of life down here and I start, you know, uh, syncing up with the kind of Eastern Shore way, if you, if you will. Um, so uh, that, that's been, it's been, um, it's been really important to me actually. And, uh, and as time goes on, it's become more important, I would say. Um, uh, because as I said before, I, at first, I didn't realize, I thought it was just going to be a one-off film. I didn't realize this would become a major part of my life. I think my connection to the shore and the people here grew naturally out of my first documentary, which was about my own family's uh, dairy farm in central New York State and the generations of uh, rural life there. And so that that rural experience is, is part of me. You know, I grew up visiting that farm, um, being part of, you know, raising cows uh, for a living, even though I didn't do it, my uncle did it, and then my cousin did it. And so I've always felt like um, I can relate to people who live that rural life, and um, I can connect with that, and I feel comfortable with that. Uh, which puts me in a, in a kind of an interesting position because I've also, you know, I, I grew up a couple counties above New York City. I lived in New York City for 20 plus years. So um, again, it's sort of that dual track thing, but I think I'm able to communicate with people, but then I also have the capability to take that and make it into a story that um, you know my friends in New York can look at and understand. So it's funny because a lot of times you would think when you sit in a room and you turn a camera on that people are going to close up and they're going to worry about what they're going to say, and sometimes that happens. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes, you know, we interview a lot of people and some of them don't make it into the film or, or just in the film a little bit. But more often than not, I find that when you turn the camera on and really listen to someone and take them seriously and they understand that they, this is coming from a place of respect, they open up. Um, people want to tell their stories. Uh, and that, that goes for my other work as well. I mean, I've had people open up about really personal 
uh, stuff that they, they went through, you know, in terms of um, having their life turned upside down by their experience in war or, um, or you know, going against what the government was, was wishing for them to do and the pressures of that. So um, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a skill you learn maybe partly, um, a, a people skill, I guess you could call it, how to, how to interact with people, how to make them feel comfortable. Um, but I can't take too much credit for it. I really feel like um, uh, that people want their stories heard. And so um, when you give them that opportunity, a lot of them open up. You know, the films in a way are very much for the local community in one respect and for having a record of the life here. Um, but as time has gone on, it's become more and more clear to me that this is a record for the world in a way, um, that I'm, I'm doing this sort of longitudinal, years long, maybe even decades long study of um, anthropological canvas, if you will, or tapestry of life here. And so, yeah, when I'm making the films, I use the same storytelling techniques and um, wanting to make it engaging and, and interesting characters and, and uh, drama uh, that I would in, in any film, uh, any other documentary that I would make, and, and, and any other film. I mean, I, I, have, um, I have experience in dramatic film as well, and I think that has um, served me in understanding uh, how all stories, in a way, are, are about characters and arc of drama and experiences over time, etc. So uh, it, 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 is a, it has occurred to me that it's, it has been very important and becomes, I'm increasingly aware that, you know, a lot of the people who tell these oral histories are senior citizens, there are elders, uh, and yes, a number of them are no longer with us that have, have been in, in these films. Some of them have been in multiple films. They come back as sort of recurring characters. And now they're long, no longer here. So I really feel like it's been important to, to capture those stories before the people who remember them go away. Um, sadly, I mean, there's some people that we missed. Uh, you know, I, and I, I kind of wish we... Um, we interviewed Mama Girl, for instance, the, the artist um, from around here that, that's um, just su such an interesting figure. And, um, but just, you know, you can't get to everyone and we were doing other things. And, and so um, uh, we're trying. <laughs> but um, I, think, I think, you know, that it makes it all very poignant when you realize that there is a time frame, there's a time limit for capturing a lot of this stuff. The story of the Cobbs is sort of like the origin story for the Eastern Shore, you know? If it was a Marvel movie, it would be the prequel where you found out how they became the superhero. And I think they, you know, Nathan Cobb and his sons are sort of like superheroes to, to the people here. I mean, their stories are, are well known, their exploits, um, their sort of sheer force of will that, you know, coming down here going out to an empty sandbar and creating, you know, a mini empire, basically, that went on for decades. And that was a resort that was known from, you know, New York and Boston all the way down to, you know, North Carolina and South Carolina and Baltimore and, and Washington. And, um, and to have it self-sustaining and to have stores there that they built and and farms on land to supply the, their food. And I mean, it was an amazingly integrated um, entrepreneurial enterprise. Um, and, you know, it's filled with fascinating uh, characters. But I, I do think the core, you know, there's some core qualities of the character of the Cobbs that kind of have been passed down. I think it's part of like what the Eastern Shore is, which is this resilience, hard work, independence, knowledge of how to live off the water and the land, um, kind of a stubbornness uh, and kind of a willfulness and kind of a pride. I think all of those things are really character, character traits of the region in a way that I think, I think of, a sort of a more traditional part of the way of life here. It's, the, the shore has always been a kind of a combination of isolated and connected. 
Um, the wonderful Grayson Chesser, who appears in several of my films, uh, said, you know, this idea of backwoods, out of the way, isolated, really isn't true, especially back in the day when the water was the interstate. I mean, before cars and trucks and before trains, water was the trade method. And so being located where this place was made it, you know, an excellent place, not just to grow food, for instance, but to get it transported out um, because it's coastal. And so um, there's always been sort of a, this, those two things going on at once. So in a way, the way of life is kind of isolated and protected. Um, and of course, now you've got this, this, this whole chain of wild barrier islands that kind of keep it um, very um, uh, protected and apart. Uh, but at the same time, it's always been a draw. It's, it was a draw for for these sportsmen and and you know wealthy industrialists to come down and have a playground on the on the eastern shore and hunt and fish and bring their families down to swim, you know in the 19th century that's what the cobs were doing. And now it's kind of a mecca in a way too, still because that the specialness of the ecology here, the environment attracts all kinds of people, people who want to you know try their hand at organic farming or people who just want to live in a place like this that, ha that has such character or artists. There's a lot of artists that come down here, you know, kind of set up shop because you can do it more affordably than you can in New York City, certainly. Uh, but also there's, a, there's um, it's just so inspiring, you know, the spirit of this place. Uh, the terroir as, uh, as uh, the sense of place, as, as Bernie Herman uh, calls it in, in um, Welcome to the Table, um, is very strong. And I think that's always been an inspiration to folks. It's always been a draw for people to come from elsewhere. Um, but not so many that it changes the character entirely. And so there's always that dynamism, uh, that little bit of that tension that's going on. Um, and um, it's just part of what it is here. I think there are threads that continue from film to film to film. We've, we've talked about some of them already. I mean, certainly the spirit of the place, the environment, the, you know, this rural coastal living, which almost is, is an anomaly now. It doesn't really exist that much anymore. Certainly on the East Coast, this is it. This to have this big stretch of like farm on the seashore is pretty unusual. Um, and so that way of life connected to the water, connected to the land, it imbues every single one of these films, no matter what the specific topic is. Um, and I think um, the spirit of the islands kind of is, comes out in all of them. Some of the character traits that I was talking about before, you know, in regards to the cobs, but th those are the traits you see in, in the people um, that populate these movies. But again, what I find fascinating is that truly important global issues are often reflected in what I'm recording here about the specific ways of life. So, um, you know, for instance, w when I was making uh, Spirit of the Bird about decoy carvers and hunters, little did I know that they would start talking about the sea level rise here and how um, that's affected their way of life and how it really is part of what's going on globally with sea level rise. And um, that came up again, um, the changes to the fisheries, you know, worldwide came up in Waterman when I was um, interviewing all of these independent fishermen. Uh, and so um, that's important to me to have uh, people who can articulate in their own voice, their own lived experience that's reflecting a, a much larger kind of um, global issues of global importance. Um, it's one thing for me to, you know, I never have a narrator, but you know, to have a narrator come on and tell you about the sea level rise and how important that is, is one thing, but to have people who are living that that's, that's a kind of um, authority that's really, um, I think, trustworthy. And uh, it gives, it's a, gives a very specific window into a much larger 
uh, issue. And so um, that has happened in a lot of these movies. Uh, and, and it's because of where this place is. I mean, it's incredibly ecologically sensitive and it's very much connected. You know, the shore is a dynamic place. The islands are incredibly dynamic. And so it's gonna be very much connected to, you know, global um, ecological trends. It's, there's always, there are always surprises and revelations for me. Uh, you know, when I was making the second film, Spirit of the Bird, I had never spent, I had never hunted as a kid. I didn't come from a hunting family. I always just like loved animals and probably looked on hunting sort of negatively, if anything. And so to be out there on these hunts with these men and to see what it really was, and to see how connected that was to sort of a really normal, natural life um, sort of cycle. And to hear them talk about it in such kind of thoughtful, even poetic ways, um, really changed how I thought about um, hunting and, and what its place was and what the people who are like who do that. And so it's a privilege to be able to have access to these people that I normally would not. Um, and that goes for watermen or, or it goes for, you know, the people even just sharing their recipes and welcome to the table. Um, and, you know, I, I've, been to, I've in particular, you know, over the years, we've tried to broaden the scope of the films a little bit. And you can see that as they go on, there's sort of a broader cast of characters. We're incorporating, you know, I think the African-American community more and have had some really fascinating characters telling, telling their stories. And I hope to do that moving forward um, to incorporate even more of the facets of life here because there's, you know, hidden away are all these different little subcultures, um, whether they're based on, um, you know, what people do or people's ethnic or, or racial background or some combination. Uh, so there's lots more uh, to explore. Yeah. I just think there are more stories to tell. Um, there are things I'm curious about that I don't know about. You know, for instance, you look at the names of all the places around here, Wachapri, Nassawadaks, um, all of these are Native American words. But I don't know anything about the Native American history here, and I'm very curious about it. Um, I've yet to meet a Native American on the shore, as a matter of fact. So my wheels are spinning and I'm thinking about like, hmm, I gotta investigate that. I wonder if there's a story there. You know, all the time I, I go over to people's houses and they have a, like an arrowhead collection. You know, oh yeah, I got these in the field um, when I was like, you know, planting this year. And so um, I go, hmm, hmm, there's a, there's a thread that we haven't really covered yet. And um, I mean, it's not unique to the shore. I think it's that way in a lot of places. I, I went to, a, you know, when I grew up in the Hudson Valley, uh, the school district was Wappingers, you know, which was named after the local uh, Indian tribe. Um, but this is, this is kind of how we know, na the only way we kind of know native culture is, is usually just the names that are left over. But there's more to it than that. You know, we touched on it a little bit in, in Welcome to the Table because you know Bernie Herman talked about how native um, traditions kind of are infused in some of the cooking here. Um, but I would like to you know explore that thread more, for instance. So um, there there are there are you know so many stories here. It's a it's a it's a it's a small focused canvas in a way, but it's bigger than you think. <laughs> and once you get looking close at that canvas, you realize all the, all the threads that are in it um, that make up this amazing, um, diverse, uh, vibrant, um, unique coastal rural American culture. Uh, so there's more work to do.